which hopefully you've met, but if not, it shouldn't worry you because I won't go into any of the mathematics in great detail. But I'll give you two examples, then I'll give you a few more. The first example are complex numbers. So when I first learned about square roots, you know, you first question you ask is what's the square root of 2, what's the square root of 4? Then about half an hour later, you say, what's the square root of minus 1? And when you first learn about square roots, the teacher at school says, there's no such thing as the square root of minus 1. It doesn't exist. And then a bit later, you, you, you go to university maybe, or, or maybe an A-level. Um, you hear that people give the square root of minus 1 a name. They call it I. And then they give you rules for manipulating the square root of minus 1. You can form what are called complex numbers. These are kind of regular numbers, A and B, where B is multiplied by I. So 2 plus 7I or something like that would be a complex number. 3.1 plus I times uh, 15 would be another complex number. And you learn rules for manipulating these numbers, and it's a great game. You can multiply them, you can divide them, you can add them, you can subtract them. All the things you do with the regular numbers, you can do with the complex numbers. And it seems kind of beautiful, it's fun, you get good at the manipulations. But when I first learned about these things, I thought they were absolutely fascinating. It's a great game, lot very interesting. But it seemed not to be real somehow. No pun intended. Um, it seemed not to be real because OK, you can play this game, but what's it got to do with the real world? What are these numbers? And I felt very dissatisfied. And then I went to university and people said, well, they're kind of useful. You can solve some problems with complex numbers. They're kind of very useful. And I said, well, are they essential? And they said, no, no, they're not essential. And then I felt kind of cheated. So I went through the early part of my life feeling cheated by complex numbers. I felt I could manipulate them and was kind of good at that. Um, but mathematicians had invented these just for the fun of it. Um, and they'd become very good at developing general theorems about these complex numbers. But how are they related to the real world? So that's one example. Another example are matrices, which I'm not sure if you meet at A-level. I did when I did A-level, but syllabus is change. Um, matrices are collections of numbers. Here's a two by two matrix. So it has two rows and two columns. You form these four numbers, A, B, C, D. Uh, could be two, one, three, two, or something like that. You form some collection of these, and then you invent rules for manipulating these objects, these collections of numbers. You can multiply them, you can add them, uh, you can subtract them, and in certain circumstances, you can do something equivalent to division by them. Um, and that seems like a great game. But again, what's this got to do with the real world? Well, you kind of learn first year at university, these are very useful in solving certain equations in the real world, but they're not essential. At least that's what I learned in my first year. So where are they essential in the real world? In particular, you learn something very curious about multiplying these matrices, and this is that it, the way you multiply them depends on their order. So m times n is not the same as n times m. And that seems weird, because surely if you multiply things that appear in the real world, uh, the order shouldn't matter. 3 times 7 is 7 times 3. 15 times 9 is 9 times 15. So what are these kind of weird objects that, where the multiplication depends on the order you multiply them by? So these are two examples of games that mathematicians have come up with that are tremendous fun, but they were invented just for the fun of it, just because they're interesting and not because of application, they had applications in mind. Here are some other examples. The first one we might argue about, because you could say that calculus does have some concepts in it that are elementary, computing areas or computing tangents, but it has many concepts in it that I think go beyond the elementary. For example, computing second derivatives. Uh, they're kind of not so intuitive, and most people go through their lives not understanding a second derivative, uh, and especially when you get to the higher derivatives. You sort of think this is getting a bit far from reality. Um, but we can argue about calculus. But there are, there are several others here which are our list. Vectors. You might, might have met vectors at school. I don't know. These are kind of matrix-like objects, which, again, you learn to manipulate. Um, there are rules to manipulate them. Uh, but are they intrinsic to the real world, or are they just a convenience? Non-Euclidean geometry. Well, we all learn at school things like you know, elementary properties of triangles and circles, uh, spheres and the like. Um, but in the 19th century, mathematicians, just for the fun of it, thought, could there be some non-Euclidean axioms? So the regular geometry is based on certain axioms which go back to Euclid. Could you have some other axioms that give you a completely self-consistent geometry? So there's no contradictions in this geometry, but it's a different geometry. 
And in the 19th century, they came up with that as non-Euclidean geometry, and it's weird, weird geometry. Um, but they did it just for the fun of it. It was just a pure invention, just a game, just because it was interesting. Geometry in more than three dimensions. I think Chris Hells mentioned this earlier. Again, you can say, what are, what's a sphere like in 18 dimensions? We can say, well, who cares? You know, what's 18 dimensions? Who cares about 18 dimensions? Mathematicians love this kind of game um, because you can ask all sorts of interesting questions, and some properties are very counterintuitive. Symmetries. We all know if you have an object, you can find its symmetries. Uh, if you have a cube, you can flip it around in certain ways, and it doesn't change the shape of the cube. And again, in the 19th century, mathematicians became great at studying the symmetries of objects, and they became so obsessed with it, they started to study symmetries in their own right, without even asking whether there was an object which had those symmetries. And you can invent all sorts of weird, weird symmetries, and then you step back and say, but is there an object that has this kind of symmetry? And actually, in the 19th century, the answer was no. So it became a game that mathematicians became good at playing. There are many other examples, uh, but these are the ones I'll stick with. So this is mathematics. This is what mathematics is. According to Wigner, it's a set of games with rules invented by mathematicians just to have fun, just because it's interesting, motivated by kind of conceptual beauty, uh, conceptual interest, not motivated by applications. This is Wigner's definition. So now Wigner goes on to define what physics is. And he says, well, physics is all about the discovery of laws of inanimate nature, about things that aren't alive. Um, and it's a study of regularities or patterns in the observed world. So we all know that if you look at the world, you see some kind of patterns there. Um, and, uh, and it's the study of those patterns. And he gives us an example, um, Galileo's experiment, where you get two objects stand over the Leaning Tower of Pisa, look down and drop them. And these objects might have different masses, but they hit the floor at the same time. So if you're Galileo, you think, wow, that's, that's very interesting that the time it takes for these objects to hit the floor doesn't depend on their mass. Um, and you do this for a whole range of objects, and then you come up with a kind of general rule that that's a general property of the world. Now, some of these laws, some of these properties of the real world, appear to be very fundamental. They kind of don't depend very much on the precise details of the experiment. It doesn't matter whether you're Galileo or somebody else. It doesn't matter whether you're a man or a woman doing this experiment. It doesn't matter whether you're a person doing the experiment. You could get a machine to drop these balls. It doesn't matter what, very much what the air temperature is or the uh, meteorological conditions, these balls will hit the floor at the same time pretty much, pretty accurately. Um, and this seems to be a very general universal property of the world. And this is the kind of important law that physics is all about. Now, the interesting thing that um, Wigner points out is that many of the laws of physics were initially proposed based on very little data. But they're very robust. They then go on to describe further experiments well outside the range that they were initially intended to describe. So, this works not just in Pisa, this experiment. It works in America. It would work on a different planet. It would work if you were orbiting the star in a different galaxy. This is, seems to be a kind of universal property of the world. And that's what physics is all about, discovering these universal properties of the world. 